O'Brien's down in the guts of the station, in one of the ore processing sections used in the occupation specifically, and he's got Jake with him for some reason. Maybe he fancied another go at his apprenticeship. They're looking at converting it into something useful, and that means going through the old computer systems to delete what won't be needed. Cisco arrives to check on both the work and his son, just as Jake is having some technical issues with a particular file. O'Brien doesn't know what's in it, so decides archiving it to look later is the best option. The computer itself disagrees with him and throws a wobbly, one that O'Brien's codes can't disable. The wobbly becomes a full-blown tantrum, and it's joined by the doors being closed. The reason, as far as the computer is concerned, is because there's a Bajoran uprising in one of the processing areas. The old tenants of the station took a poor view of such things and have security to prevent it. Indeed, a pre-recorded message from Gul Dukat, the cardigan in charge of the station during the occupation, appears on screens all over the place. It's a gentle reminder that rebellion is a big no-no, not least of which because it's a waste of labour. He gives the assumed uprising eight minutes to return control to their cardigan supervisors, which is going to be somewhat of a problem as they don't exist. The face disappears to leave a standby screen that now bears the logo of the Cardigan Union. It would appear we've reverted to a system backup. A call from Kira up in Ops lets she and Sisko bring each other up to speed, and she tries to teleport them out. Not an option, says the computer. An uprising is bloody dangerous, so anybody trying to use the computers needs an emergency code, one that we don't have. Odo still got his pre-liberation codes from when he was appointed by Ducat, but they're not high enough to do anything. Q Quark entering to see if he can find out what's going on, the televised threats from Ducat not being good for business. Our resident dodgy git doesn't have stolen codes that go high enough either, though Odo's a bit miffed to find Quark's nefarious methods provide access one level above his own. At least he says they do, but maybe this is more sparring. If so, he's chosen the wrong time for it. Odo tells Quark to sod off so he can concentrate, though Quark refuses. Self-preservation is a strong instinct in him, and if things are going wrong on the station, he thinks being near Odo offers the best odds. Time's running out for Ducat's ultimatum. Good news, though, Cisco's had an idea. The system thinks they're rebelling and Ducat wants them to stop, so identifying himself as the leader and surrendering would seem to be a pretty sound choice. A success and a new message from Ducat tells them Cardigan Security will be along shortly to accept their surrender. Sounds good, though that might change in a few minutes when the system doesn't get an update from the non-existent security guards. We need another solution then, and we have a bonus the Bajoran workers didn't. The machines are all off. That means Jake can scramble his way through one of them and open a hatch to another area. Not ideal, but it's the only option. Another recording from Ducat notes no surrender has been logged with the system, and if it isn't in three minutes, everybody in this room is going to be breathing something that sounds suspiciously like a neurotoxin. Sisko and O'Brien guide Jake through the machine, and after he opens the hatch, they climb some plastic pallets and escape just as gas begins to fill the room. Tangentially, yes, those plastic pallets are the same ones as Cisco got locked in for the episode in Season 2, which makes me wonder which company is selling to both the Federation and Cardassia. Such questions will have to wait, as we have a bigger problem. The system has detected Cisco, O'Brien and Jake escaping and locked everything down, which is bad news for everyone in Ops, as they're now trapped too. A new recording from Ducat warns the escapees to surrender, or he'll just kill all Bajorans instead. Perhaps the gas was made to not harm cardigans, though I personally think it's just as likely that anybody posted to the station was simply told that it wouldn't. Cisco, O'Brien, and Jake have found their way into a new part of the processing plant. They're safe for now, assuming they closed the hatch after them and it's airtight, but something's stopping them from phoning ops. They'll have to either save themselves or settle in for a wait. The wait may be a long one, as Ops is fully locked down. Kira poops some yellow at a door panel so we can open it manually, and her reward is headbutting a force field. It would appear the cardigans took keeping people out of Ops significantly more seriously than Starfleet do. Those force fields have turned on everywhere, and they extend through decks. That means everybody's locked up, including Odo, as there's no gap for him to exploit. Here's hoping those force fields don't extend to the mining areas, as there's not much point in trying to ram the door with a cart if they do. Of course, there's not much point anyway, as it's doing no damage. Time to MacGyver this shit. The ore that used to be refined here was unstable and can be detonated with electricity, so let's start breaking things and see what we can rig up, shall we? 
Similar fiddling is happening in ops, though with unpleasant results. A force field burns Dax's hands, and that causes the system to consider ops itself as having been overrun. Another recording from Ducat informs us that he'll be forced to fart that neurotoxin through the station's quarters in five minutes if no surrender has been logged. It's handy, then, that we're finally getting some good news. Plain simple Garak is here, and he has a code that'll turn off force fields. The bad news is the code is only useful for him as the fields turn back on again when he's passed by them. That means he can't evacuate anyone and the code isn't of sufficient authorization to cancel the emergency. He does have an idea, though. Destroy life support. It's not as silly as it sounds, either, as it's this system that'll disperse the gas. No life support means no toxin. Of course, they'll all suffocate or freeze in about 12 hours, but that's an upgrade from being gassed in five minutes. Kara gets to kaboom her second gizmo of the episode, and the station's life support systems go down. Gas prevented and problem solved, except we're only halfway through the episode, so obviously there's a wrinkle. This one comes in the form of a failsafe, or I suppose that should be fail dangerous. See, the gas release was part of a security response, and as that response is no longer possible, it upgrades to the next. Ducat appears once more, and in a very sad manner indeed, informs us that the uprising has taken the station, and he's probably dead. Looks like he's of the opinion that revenge is a dish best served with explosives, which is why, in two hours, this entire station is going to kaboom. Quark is not taking the news well. Trying to poop his way through a force field is rather optimistic, and Odo takes the toy off him. That leaves Quark with nothing to do but become morose at the prospect of his impending doom. It's not just the death, though that's certainly a big part of it, but also that he never made it big like his moon-owning cousin. It might just be pity, but Odo calls him the most devious Ferengi he's ever met, and the compliment cheers him up a little. Up in Ops, plain simple Garak still fiddling. That code of his has given him access, but on a read-only basis, so he can't change anything. It looks like the only person who can is Ducat himself. New plan, then. Rig the system to read him as Ducat, and bugger the scanners in here so they can't check to make sure it's really him. The idea falls flat at the first hurdle, as Ducat placed countermeasures around his identification methods. The computer sounds a new alarm and raises the threat level once more, this particular step involving the replicator making an automated turret. Quite an inventive concept, though I doubt Jimmy No Name feels the same way when he gets roasted by it. Just as everybody's feeling that things can't get any worse, they do. Somebody teleports into Ops, and the somebody is Ducat. He says he was out patrolling when he received a call from himself to warn of a rebellion, presumably a general distress signal. That's not the sort of thing you can ignore, so he popped over for a look. He can solve all of this naturally, but everything has a price, and he removes the turret so he and Kira can have a chinwag in the office. In short, he wants to post some cardigans back on the station. Just a small garrison, and he can do it right now, in fact, as he's already carrying some troops, just in case Bajor changes its mind when the crisis has passed. Kira tells him to eat a barrel of dick, so he says he'll pop back over just before things get explodey and ask again. He tries to teleport away, and is a little surprised when nothing happens. Well, not exactly nothing, as the command has triggered a new recording, only not from Descartes. This is from someone new, and the message calls Ducat a coward for trying to scarp her while the revolt is taking place. It also tells him his codes won't work anymore, and the kaboom can no longer be shut off. That's what you get for trying to be a cocky twat. If we're going to stop the kaboom, we need to know how it'll happen. Ducat says it'll be an overload of the main reactor, and that gives us an option. We might not be able to disengage the self-destruct itself, but if we shut off the reactor, there'll be nothing to make the kaboom. Unfortunately, there are a lot of force fields between us and the reactor, and thanks to the alert Ducat triggered, now even plain simple Garak's codes don't work. Maybe Cisco and company can get there first. Their plan to explode the door works, and we should not question how a line of rocks on the floor manages to blow a circular hole in something above them while the rocks themselves remain intact. Off they go through the hole before physics catches up with them and calls them all a bunch of lying bastards. While they explore, we're trying to find a solution in ops. Nobody's convinced by Ducat saying he can break through the program he wrote, and Dax ponders a different approach by wondering if we can overload the force fields all in one go with a power surge. 
It feels a bit dodgy to be dicking around with that when the reactor is what's going to kaboom them in less than half an hour, but they don't have a lot to lose. Ducat has the answer for an overload. There's a gizmo in ops, specifically a rather deadly security measure, because unlike the Federation, the Cardigans take such things seriously. His assumptions that the Bajorans would have disabled it, but not bother ripping it out, prove accurate, and he thinks that, that might be enough of a drain to cause the overload Dax wants. Dax says it'll fry the lifts and teleporters too, though thinks it's a fair trade. I'd point out that neither of them would work during the security lockdown anyway, but they seem to have forgotten all about that. Back to Cisco and Associates, and they've run up against some force fields. Cisco thinks the lift shafts are an option, though I'd argue they'd also have force fields on, so it's lucky the crew in ops turns them all off by triggering that overload. It also means their phones are working now too, whatever was inhibiting them having been disabled as well. That's handy, as we've only got ten minutes before the whole place goes bang, and nobody in ops can get to the reactor in time, so it's up to Cisco and O'Brien. Jake argues there's little point in him trying to scarper given the lack of time, so he's going as well. No force fields means we can try to evacuate others at least, though apparently not Quark and Odo. Their systems are on a different circuit, it seems, and Quark thinks it's because Ducat knew Odo would be inclined to take the morally right option if anything ever kicked off. Time's getting a bit tight, and Cisco thinks we won't have enough of it to do the job properly. That being the case, he suggests channeling the reactor explosion into the shields. I personally think there are a few logistical problems with controlling the explosion of a nuclear reactor using something powered by the reactor, and that's before we even consider the fact that we just kaboomed a fair portion of the station's systems, but we've only got four minutes left in the episode, so we don't have time for logic. It's the climax of the episode, so of course we're going to crawl through conduits because of debris, and of course those conduits are going to be dangerous. O'Brien takes a kaboom to the arse, and Sisko continues on without him, Jake crawling in himself to drag O'Brien to safety, despite his dad telling him to stay put. Sisko knows how to do reactor and shield things himself, though, so it's all fine, and we poop some lightning at the shield and say, that was the explosion of a fusion reactor, which... <sighs> yeah, all right then. Exploding a nuclear reactor has either had no effect on it whatsoever, or we had plenty of backups. Regardless, the doors to Odo's office are open again, so the additional security systems, just for him, must have turned off too. Quark's taken the chance to poke at Odo's computer while his back was turned, and discovered his own file is less than complimentary. It's far from Odo's previous comment about Quark being devious, and Odo tells him he only said that because he thought he'd be letting Quark die happier. Their sparring starts up again as they walk along the promenade, so we'll leave them to bicker to themselves and not think about the fact that we still don't have a life support system until the next adventure. The more observant among you might have noted from my subtle and reserved criticisms during the recap that I did not particularly care for this one. It's a good idea for a story that devolves into something that feels rather by the books and lacking care and polish, the best example being the business with dumping the explosion into the shields. It's there to create a spectacle, something more visually pleasing than Sisko and O'Brien simply succeeding, and bugger the fact that it's complete nonsense. That's quite the shame, as everybody involved does a decent job, and the premise really is an interesting one. Automated systems to prevent uprisings are both plausible and a chance to see more cardigan scheming. A trap hidden under Ducat's program to punish him for leaving shows not only just how deep the planning goes, but also how little faith they actually have in each other beneath that outward appearance of service and sacrifice. That theme of individuals scheming against each other continues with Ducat and Plain Simple Garak. We get more nods to history between them, and the first mention of something tangible. References are made to Ducat's dad and an unfortunate fate, one that involved him trusting plain simple Garak, if Ducat is to be believed. The justice system had Ducat's father claiming publicly that his own ambition was his downfall, but the episode Tribunal from the last season gives us a very clear indication that their courts care less about truth than image. His confession may have been accurate, but it could just as easily have been the result of yet another scheme, something forced from him by threats to his family. Hell, it might even have been because of his family. Ducat achieving power after the conviction of his own dad certainly indicates that he didn't publicly resist the proceedings.
Not everything in the episode with Ducat is good, though, and the scene regarding Kira, commented on by Plain Simple Garak, gave me the ick for reasons I couldn't quite put my finger on at the time. It's Nana Visitor herself who managed to put it into words for me when I read about the background for the episode. She's previously said, I would have liked my character to make the point that only a few years earlier, Ducat's wanting me would have meant that he could have had me, and I wouldn't have been able to do a thing about it. So it shouldn't have been seen as a cute moment. It was actually a horrifying moment, one that would make Kira feel disgust and panic. To Kira, Ducat is Hitler. She's not ever going to get over that. She can never forgive him, and that is important to me. Kira may have started to see Cardassians as individuals, but she will always hate Ducat. We've mentioned before that there are times when Trek misses the mark, and I'd agree with Visitor that playing this as something almost twee shows not only a lack of judgement on tone, but also little understanding on power imbalances from the writers. There's probably a larger discussion to have there about why that's the case, and things like reports of Berman's misogyny might go away to explaining why, but that's a subject worthy of greater exploration than we can provide here. Let's try and end on something more positive, shall we? I love the idea of replicators spawning intrusion countermeasures in the event of a security alert. The example used here is a turret, but imagine a system set up to shit out automated drones after detecting intruders, or just something simple like creating a knockout gas. The sheer versatility and power of such an idea is probably why future writers didn't use it. Being able to immediately solve any hostile situation in a room with replicators undermines so many plots that it essentially breaks the whole setting. It's a fun little reminder, then, that there's such a thing as being too clever when writing a story, and that some consideration must be made to ensure those who come after you are always left with options. End of episode. So we've ruled out the replimat. Delicious asperat, but no clues. And we've ruled out the bar. First quenched, though, no mention of Mr. Morden. We've examined the hollow sweets. Fun games. Alas, not helpful. And we've asked at the Dabo tables. No leads, but a healthy pile of latinum. You know, I'm beginning to suspect you aren't taking this search as seriously as you could be. Woof.